Welcome to Four Wheels Good. I'm Diana Binks and I've taken over the driver's seat of this, one of the sleekest, the fastest and most finely tuned motor programmes on TV today. In the programme today we revisit Mark Nuttall and his quest to drive sensibly and competitively on ice in Norway. Stephen Vokens finds out where you need to be if you're a fan of the sturdy and reliable old Land Rover. And our very own maestro of motor mechanics will be burying his head deeper amidst a metro. But first, we are all aware of the burgeoning reputation that Seat has these days, especially with its Ibiza. Well, Mike Rutherford, willing motoring journalist, has been driving one of the hottest Ibizas and seeing whether it's able to take on the competition. <laughs> They've done it again. A couple of weeks ago, of course, we were talking about the tiny Seat Arosa, which has to be the best value for money sub super mini on the market. Now the Spanish company have come up with this little beauty. Now the Ibiza has been around for a while, as you probably know, but not in this sort of guise. This is the 16 valve GTI Cupra version. It's based on the car that gave them their recent F2 rally success, and it is effectively a Golf GTI wearing Seat badges, if you like. Uh, it's basically the hot Ibiza, and hot it is. Uh, very well equipped, got a great interior, but 150 brake horsepower, do 0 to 60 in something like eight seconds, twice the legal speed limit. And it's Seat once again demonstrating that they're a fun company, they concentrate on performance, on quality, and they've done a great job. I mean, visually, although it's not a new shape, it does look the part, I'm sure you'll agree. What is this car called? I think it's called the Seat Cupra, whatever Cupra means, Sport. GTI 2 litre 16 valve. Yeah, I think that's it. If you want this car, you go into a dealership and you say, Can I please have a Seat Cupra Sport GTI 2 litre 16 valve, please? I mean, nonsense. How about something? <laughs> I think it's about time we had some names that are a little bit simpler and a little bit easier to understand and remember. Like I said, this car is based on the Seat Ibiza rally car, and the rally car has these white 16-inch wheels, and of course the road-going version has the same wheels, proving the point, of course, that this car is very different from a standard Ibiza. In fact, Seat say that this is the only car on the market, the only super mini on the market, with wheels this big, and they look very nice when the car's clean, but let me just warn you that uh, I've only been driving this vehicle for a day or two, and already there's an awful lot of brake dust come off those discs and is on those wheels. And while we're looking at this sort of area of the car, it also has Michelin uh, Pilot tyres and it has ABS, anti-lock brakes, and traction control. So if you throw this thing off the road, you will have to do something pretty damn special. This does a great job. It's got a height adjustable uh, seat so that you can really sink low. Height adjustable steering wheel while we're at the traffic lights. Uh, I can uh, play with that. We've got these lovely white dials, black figures on white dials. And then at night, instead of the traditional green lights illumination, which we see on most uh, cars, this is orange uh, background lighting. And there's a rheostat here, an adjust light adjuster to ensure that uh, you can tone that down and God, it needs to be toned down because the combination of the white background and the orange lights are a bit garish, but like I said, you can tone it down, no problem. I love this little trip computer on here. It tells me that um, since the computer was last set, 
I've been driving for 88 hours and 33 minutes. Can you believe that? 88 hours and 33 minutes behind the wheel of this car. I've done 3,301 miles. I've done an average speed of 37 miles an hour. That might sound pretty slow, but don't forget, of course, a lot of those miles would have been around town, 10, 12 miles an hour. Got an average fuel consumption. This is an interesting one. 29.5 mpg and that ain't bad going i think for a two liter 16 valve sports car I'm not sure about these switches here for the electric windows being down here the logical place for the switches is here i love the leather seats really nice bucket seats with lots of side support i'm not too sure about this design it's on the door panels as well here but um, i don't know 10 out of 10 for being a little bit different and what about this i mean really i know the spaniards are really into putting bits and bobs up behind the sun visor. And sure enough, this Spanish firm have given them a place to put it. Look, radio is a nonsense. I mean, God, what does it mean? There's a button here that says loud expert. I just don't know what it means. I haven't a clue. I know I've got my jacket on, but it's a bit warm in here, actually. It's a very dark interior and not very airy. There's no sunroof and there's no air conditioning. And on some Seats, although they're modestly priced cars, air conditioning comes as standard. You're gonna love this. The reason there's no sunroof, the reason there's no air conditioning on this car, is because they want to save weight. I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? What a load of bollocks. They want to save weight, so they take out the sunroof, or they don't put it in in the first place, and they don't fit air conditioning. I mean, why not go the whole hog? Why not take the seats out? Now, this is the crunch. How does it drive? If you're getting your kicks from roaring away from traffic lights and burning rubber and playing silly games with other boy racers well you might be a little bit disappointed in this car warm hatch not hot hatch mike rutherford there demonstrating that Seat really are well and truly established in the hot hatch market land rovers are one of the best known and most fondly regarded vehicles on and off the road today hardly surprising since they've been around for so long but if you want to see where lovers of these mighty and yet simple beasts congregate Watch on. Weekends are tricky things. For five days of the week, you work hard, but at the weekends, you can do what you like. Some people go shopping, some people do DIY, heaven knows why, and others attend auto jumbles. For the really dedicated petrol head though, for the person who knows what they want, they tend to go for one make auto jumbles. And today we're here at Old Sodbury to see one such one make auto jumble. It's called the Old Sodbury Sort Out and it's dedicated to the products of Solihull, the Land Rover. <laughs> Well, I finally managed to run to ground. The, the man responsible for today calls himself the old sod. Jim, tell me more about today. Well, basically, it's a, it's a get together of people that are, are either fed up with falling over Land Rover bits and pieces or they're desperately looking for Land Rover bits and pieces. So, at the end of the day, the aim is that those that have brought stuff finish up with some space and those that have come with empty vehicles go back with that vitally needed spare part. That's the theory. It doesn't work out like that, of course. They all seem a very motivated gang of enthusiasts. How have you managed to get them all here today and how long have you been doing it for? I think it's basically motivated by uh, a want of, of spare parts and a, a shared interest in Land Rovers. The, 
feeling is that as they look round, you can either buy what you're looking for or you can find something interesting on a stall. So it, it seems to be the shared interest that brings them. Well, I found an interesting looking vehicle here that's up for sale. Tell me more about it. Well, it's, as you can see, it's a very rare Series 1. It's 109 inches long, 1.6 litre engine, one of the original ones owned by the RAF. And then we bought it off someone who had it in a garage for years and years and brought it down here to sell. So does it run? Um, yeah, with a bit of encouragement. <laughs> Now I've heard that they're just like big Meccano kits and they're easy to restore, is that right? Um, more or less, yeah, the crucial thing is the bulkhead, which you can see behind the, um, <coughs> the engine compartment, and if you get sand one of those, the chassis, you can basically do anything you like with it. But basically you could buy virtually anything you want here today, couldn't you, to restore it? Absolutely, yeah, if you've got the time and got the cash, then it's yours today. <laughs> so how much is this one? Um, £600 or there, thereabouts. I'm showing symptoms of being bitten by the bug myself. What would you recommend as a first Land Rover for me, apart from the one you're trying to sell? <laughs> Probably um, Series 3, Series 2, one that the parts are easier to get and so that if you mess up it's easy to replace them. What would you say to someone who's coming without a Land Rover for the first time and thinking about buying one? Well, I think really it's a case of you can see how the vehicle is made. You can see all the components that go into it. You'll find somewhere on these stalls that the, any component you're interested in will be on display. So that really you could almost think of this as a, an exploded workshop manual. I've seen some absolutely crazed enthusiasts yesterday, but the real Land Rover enthusiast who just can't bear to part with his car at night time when he goes in the house, I found something for him. A Land Rover in a bottle to put on your mantelpiece. Are they selling well? Uh, not too bad today, yes. Not too bad at all. And you're a Land Rover enthusiast too? Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, into the off-roading and uh, competition driving, among other things. I've never ever seen Land Rover in a bottle before, I must admit. It's quite unique. Yeah, well, we can make these to order, um, spray them up, put the roll bars on, anything, that, you know, to replicate your own vehicle if, you, if uh, we can get the models. Yeah, I see um, you, you started there with lots more Land Rovers and now they're all, virtually all gone. It's just the Jeeps yeah, that are still here. One left, um, say the Jeeps left, which obviously won't sell very well here, but uh, you never know. Once you've driven one of these, you don't really want to drive anything else. They're great fun to drive, and uh, you know when you're mixing it with the boy racers on the motorway and uh, at traffic lights, uh, you can make them <laughs> sit up and beg type of thing. Is this your only car, or do you use something else to go shopping in? Um, no, well, I do go shopping in it, but uh, I've got a Range Rover. No one seems to be talking about four-wheel drive cars, they're all talking about Land Rovers. There's no other makes here at all, are there? Uh, if somebody arrives in a Japanese vehicle, we do ask them to put a sheet over it so that it doesn't frighten the assembled company. And uh, we do actually charge a premium for non-Land Rover vehicles here, so that's a fairly effective way of discouraging them. Oh, come on, lads, it's not a Land Rover, but I know, but I, I want to go now, please. Come on, get this stuff off. Come on, be a sport. So if you need anything for your old Land Rover, you know where to go. And please let old Steve Vokins out when you're there. Well, that's it for part one. See you after the break when we'll be chilling out on a frozen lake. And inside motors mechanic John Wright will once again be conducting a service on that metro. Welcome back to Four Wheels Good. It's time now to don our woolly hats and set sail to Norway, where we catch up once again with Mark Nuttall and five other intrepid rally drivers in Stage by Stage. This was day two of my visit to John Hogland's Winter Rally School, where myself and five other drivers were being taught how to rally drive on a frozen lake. After a hearty breakfast in the Rodberg Hotel, it was straight into the Norwegian mountains to start the day's work. The six of us were here for a week. John was teaching us would-be rally drivers how to handle a competition car on a simulated stage using a rather large and extremely frozen lake. After arriving, we'd had a few checks and adjustments to make, and it was a case of strapping yourself in, popping on your lid and getting straight down to it, so to speak. John spent his time going from car to car, 
navigators to driver's seat until the respective student understood his instruction. The cars were shod on special ice tyres. These were narrow tyres with studs in. The combination of these tyres on the ice simulated gravel driving in the forest. All six of us came from different backgrounds and we all had different levels of ambition. We had a bit of an unfortunate escapade yesterday with uh, Gethin here. Can you tell us uh, what happened, Gethin? Uh, well, the car took a mind of its own and it decided it wanted to fly into its roof. Uh, but uh, it was a little bit unfortunate. It clipped this inside of a snowbank and uh, it just kicked up onto the roof and then over onto its wheels again. Last year you did the Skoda Trophy yeah, right. with me and I know that this year you're doing something different. What are you doing this year? Uh, well, Ford Motorsport have given me a, a Ford car, the new model, which is going to be in the Ford Rally Car Championship, uh, which is throughout the Mintex Championship rounds, so I should be doing that this year. Uh, giving you a car? Yes, I've managed to win it in a competition. Uh, as an assessment day and six drivers turned up. Gwyneth Evans then saw us through the day and decided that it was me that should get the keys. The lads have repaired the car and um, how's it handling now? But we'll still take specials going very, very well. Yeah, it's, uh, we've put some different tyres on the back now which seems to have made it a little bit nest nervous. So it seems to go very well. This is my old car and is currently owned and driven by Claire Moran. Claire started rallying by winning a Search for a Lady Rally Driver competition called Lady Quest. I asked her about Lady Quest. Uh, run by Silverstone Rally School and it's just a competition to try and promote more women into the sport of rallying. Um, but they've run for five years, I think they're on their sixth year now. Um, Anna was a previous winner two years before yeah. me and then um, I won last year. But it's got me into the sport and hooked so I ended up trying needing to find a car for this year because don't, you don't get win a car, you just win the drive. Right. And so I bought your car off you. Anna Tate is a stills producer in real life. Just how did she get into rally driving? By chance, really. I'd always wanted to do it, but didn't really know how. And just didn't manage to get involved for some time until my husband bought me a ticket to a rally school for a day. And that was it. They were hooked. A, yes, they ran a competition which they persuaded me to enter. And I won it, much to my own surprise and delight. <laughs> how are you finding John Hogland's rally school? Is this teaching you anything, Anna? It's teaching me a very great deal, yes. Um, because I never left foot brake properly um, before. And I've learned to left foot brake correctly this time and to steer more efficiently and to brake well and just to pick up more speed all around. Yeah, so it's helping you. Yes. And Claire? I found it very tough. Um, I've lo I lost my confidence yesterday, but I've got back in the car. I've, I, I was like Hannah, I've never left foot brake before in my life. Yeah. Um, so he's kind of teaching you to forget what you're used what to. What you've now. already learned, and it's all, it is basically forget about what, how you used to drive and start all over again, and it's quite tough. Is that, is that what you have been finding difficult? Um, yes, I think now I find, um, I can't remember how I used to drive, but I haven't um, grasped the, the basics of how John wants me to, to drive either, so I'm in between, and I'm finding that very difficult. But um, I have got myself back into the car, which is quite tough this morning, but, um, and hopefully I'll try and improve on it again today and get my confidence back. Coming back here to John's and doing the stage again is excellent practice for me because the weekend after I get home I'm doing the y Dean, which is in Wales as a warm-up for the, my first round of the British Rally Championship which is a month after that starting in the South World so hopefully I'll be all raring to go mentally, physically and the car will be perfect because I need a bit of work doing to it after this week. Um, the car setup now is pretty much how I want it Hopefully my co-driver will like it as well, even though she hasn't sat in the car yet. And she'll probably have a fit on the YD, because it's a lot quicker than the Micra I drove last year, the Micra Challenge. Um, even though it's in group head and spec and can't be messed around with too much. So, and then hopefully next year I'll be in a proper group A car with all the proper bits and just frighten the life out of myself. How on earth can they all act so casually about crashing on that lake, even if the ice is several feet thick? Anyway, we'll see how Mark and the other drivers are getting on in another Norwegian report next week. For those of you who think servicing your own car is difficult, we're now going to wing our way back over to John Wright. He'll make you think again in Inside Motors.
First of all, I'm going to take this air cleaner box off, which will give me a little bit more access to not only the air cleaner, but the plugs. That's the four bolts done. Should be some clips here. Get rid of that. Don't really think I need to comment on that, do I? And we'll just confine that to the bin. Get rid of all the rural debris. I'm just going to get rid of the air cleaner box completely, which will give us access to the plugs underneath it. So we can change those as well. Right, no. I'm going to need to undo that. Just undo this here. And take this vacuum pipe off. That's it. Just check what's underneath this. A couple of vacuum pipes. I think what I might do, yeah, is we'll just just fold that back out of the way, and then we can get access to everything underneath it. Now we're here. We'll get rid of the plug leads and the plug caps. Plug spanner, just pop the plug spanner on. We'll be back with John again next week. Mark Nuttall continues his Norse saga, John Stanley drives BMW's N1, and Stephen Vokins will be enjoying life with Ford's Explorer. That's if he gets out in time. Thanks for watching, we'll see you again next week.